you can, you can be able to take a look at two uh, very familiar verses to begin with. Uh, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. John chapter 8, 31 and 32. Two powerful verses. You know, I was just, uh, just kind of meditating on what I was going to be going over tonight, this afternoon. And, and I was thinking about uh, how amazing it must have been with Paul. Right after he was converted, uh, he spent a couple of years by himself just himself and the Spirit of God. And out of that comes, you know, two-thirds of the new covenant. He, he, didn't, uh, he didn't have any, uh, anything prior to that except his knowledge of the old covenant. And uh, uh, so it, it's just amazing that uh, in that short period of time, uh, he had amassed all of, this, uh, uh, all of this wisdom from God's Word. And, of course, he was called by God to do what he did. And, uh, and because of that, obviously, he had ears to hear. He was receptive. Uh, but much of it he had never experienced. You know, he's just like those of us that hear it today. Uh, many of the things that we read in the Word of God that are absolutely true, uh, many of us have not yet experienced. But the truth is, uh, you never will experience them until you believe that they're yours and that you believe that they're already yours. That's what walking by faith is all about. That's why there's such a big, a big chasm between uh, people that are actually walking by faith and then the majority of the Christian community. The big old wide gap there. Big old wide gap. We just happen to believe that uh, uh, everything that's been done has been done. We happen to believe that we're not trying to get something. We already got something. And what are we, whatever we have to do to, uh, to bring that to pass in our life, then that's what we'll, we're willing to do. Even if we're willing to call those things that be not as though they were. Because that's what you have to do. Hallelujah. So in John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus uh, uh, spoke to those Jews who had believed on him. He said, if you will continue in my word, you will be my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now, we've talked about these verses lots and lots of times since every one of you were here. So even those of us that have been here every year, we have still heard these a lot. But the thing about it is, uh, just knowing, just giving mental assent, or even receiving in your heart, does not make you free. You have to do what you hear. It's the doers that are blessed, you see, when the Bible says believe and the Bible says no, it wants us to understand that if we know something, then that's what we're going to do. If you know the bridge is out, you're going to slow down and you're going to find out where you can turn around. So when you know, then you're going to do what needs to be done because every time we see where we know something, we see that there's going to have to be something that we do that corresponds with what we know, just, just like believing. Huh? If you believe somebody's trying to get in the window of your house and you've got a weapon, you're just going to stand out of the way a little bit until they come in and then you're going to shoot them in the head. <laughs> or in the foot or somewhere. I'm thinking the head's the best place to shoot them. Because if they've got a weapon and you get nervous, they may end up shooting you in the head and limp out of your house because you shot them in the foot. Now, that doesn't sound much like pastoral wisdom. But the fact is, we live in a different world. We live in a different world. And um, somebody coming through your window... They need to be greeted properly. At the very least, you need to have about a six foot, two by six. Huh? And you just stand a little bit away from the window where when they come in, you just crack them over the head. You you endeavor just to try and knock them out. Amen. Not to take them out. So he told those Jews that believed on him, If you will continue in my word, 
One of the definitions of that word continue there is to take up residence. It's like you put the word on. It's like you put the word in. He said, if you'll continue in my word, then you'll be my disciples indeed. Indeed, what it takes to become a disciple is that you continue in the word. That's right. And then the word will continue to grow in you. And pretty soon it will become a part of you. You know, as we've talked about that recently, and it's become bigger and bigger on the inside of me, how the Word, become, it becomes a part of you. It's not, it's not just something that you have to uh, uh, consciously remember. Hmm? Yeah. It's not something you even have to think about. Uh, as you continue in the Word, it, it becomes a part of you. Yeah. I mean, it's like uh, you don't see things any differently than what the Word says. And that's what happens when you continue in the Word. And he said, if you continue in the Word, you'll be my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It will make you free. Amen. You don't have to get free. It will make you free. You don't have to wiggle off the hook. The hook will be removed. No longer will whatever had you trapped be able to trap you and keep you entrapped because the truth will make you free. One of the, one of the definitions of free in this particular, uh, particular verse is set at liberty from the dominion of sin and its mastery. From the dominion of sin and its mastery. Obviously, as the children of God, part of, our, part of our salvation experience is being forgiven. So no longer does sin have dominion over you. And not only does it not have dominion over you, uh, it's not bigger than you are. Uh, sin now, in your current state, can be resisted. And it can be left behind. Obviously, we still have to decide. We still determine. We still choose what level we're going to walk on. But the bottom line is, your no is bigger than anything the enemy can throw at you. It's bigger. All it takes is your willingness to continue to use the no word as long as there's issues that are trying to climb back into your life. And the enemy can't do a stinking thing about it. Truth in this particular verse is the revelation of God's will through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. The revelation of God's will through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. Maybe more simply put, whatever Jesus paid for is yours. Whatever he's done is done, is done, done. Now, just that statement will separate us some because people say, well, but what about this? We're, we have no buts in that statement. Yeah. Whatever Jesus paid for belongs to you and I. Yeah. Amen. Right now. Amen. Right now. Not when you feel like it, not when you see it, but right now. Right. He did it, it's written, and it's settled. Yeah. Amen. That doesn't make you a liar because you believe that, having not experienced it yet. That makes you someone who's going to walk by faith, and one of these days it's going to break loose in front of you, Amen. and it'll be part of you. Hallelujah. Praise God. We begin to see what we are in His Word. And then it becomes a part of us. 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read some Bible to you here. I want to talk about these things because I know some of the things I've said uh, recently. I don't want to... Uh, I just want to clarify some things. That's all. 1 Corinthians... Chapter 1.
We're going to begin in verse 10. Paul said, Now I beg you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That's really important. Sounds impossible, but obviously it's possible or he wouldn't have said to do it. And that there be no divisions among you. Sounds like that would be impossible. But Paul, by the Spirit of God, said that's what he wanted him to do. Huh? To speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You know, if you can get a group of people in agreement, you're going to have a powerful group. Amen. And that's always been God's plan is that we be in one mind and one accord. I mean, you can even break it down to two. And the Bible says if two on earth, if just two on earth will agree as touching anything that they ask, it will be done for them by the Father. That's why if you can take a married couple And they both be crazy serious about the things of God. They can have an amazing life together. Amen. They can see great things happen in their marriage and in their family by coming into agreement. You know, I don't want to be You know, I don't want to throw any poop in your, in your chocolate pie. <laughs> but you know, you, you, can't, you can't have what belongs to you if, if you're not in agreement. Now, things may happen. You know, good things happen to bad people. You know that? So also good things can happen to Christians that aren't right. (laughs) But we don't want what happens to us to be happenstance. We want it to be because we've believed, we've agreed, we've done our part. We want to be able to lay down at night and we don't have to say, Father, I thank you that 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 accident happened for us and and we're really blessed because I know I didn't have anything to do with it. But that's a good posture to maintain. A posture where you understand that you're in control of what he wants to do for your life. He's already written it. It's already settled. It's already been done. He said, I want you to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He said, for it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every, every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. Well, I'm of Cephas. Well, I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Verse 17, he said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the, of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. 
But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. You know, we can see right there in that verse, and Paul understood this, that nothing of any great consequence is going to happen unless people hear the truth. That's right. Unless people hear the truth. In verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Well, I'll tell you, we're going to see a lot of it made a fool of in the next few months. We're seeing more fools run around right now than we've ever seen. We've heard more foolishness. You hear more foolishness in one day in the time we live in than what we used to hear in a year. I mean, cubic foolishness. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Man can't get to God intellectually. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. To save them that believe. Well, when you hear the truth, you must believe. You must believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's just the way they were. It's the way they were in the New Testament. That they were, that's the way they were in the Old Testament. He said, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews, that becomes a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, it's foolishness. The heathens, the Gentiles. But unto them which are called. How many of you know everybody's called? The call went out for everybody the moment he came out of the tomb. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You know, in your personal study and meditation, you can, you can kind of look and... Uh, um, and really think about uh, what Jesus did and what Jesus said. Because everything emanates from what he did. Everything is because of what he did. Everything is available because of what he did. That's why it's important that, that, there's, that there's time spent meditating on those Three and a half years that he spent here. What he did, why he did it, what he didn't do. All of those things are important. Yeah. Why he did some of the things he did. Why he told a story of a master leaving and giving three... Uh, three of his servants different amounts of money. And he said he gave them different amounts because he gave them what he knew they were able to handle. So he didn't put somebody in a precarious position because he gave them too much. He gave them exactly what he knew they could handle. Then he left. He came back. Both of the first two doubled what they'd been given. They both got the same congratulations. The third one, however, didn't know the character of the master. He didn't understand how good he was. Because he was fearful. 
instead, instead of doing something with the resources, he just buried them. So that he would have what he'd been given to give back to him. But when the master addressed him, he said, well, I, I knew that you were a hard man. I knew that you, you would gather where you had not even sown. You know, there are people that actually believe that today in the church. Yeah. I'm not saying this church, but I mean in the church universal. They have no idea about the character of God. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? They don't know that he has tunnel vision. They don't know that what he's done is what he'll always do. And so the master, let's say it was Jesus, he said, you wicked and slothful servant. He said, guys, come get this guy. Cast him into utter darkness where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That doesn't sound like a nice rest stop on your way to heaven. That sounds like you've already found your final miserable place. There won't be any RIP for you. Huh? You see that, you know, so-and-so, RIP. I said, well, this will be the first rest they ever got because they've been going crazy for 37 years. And he said, take what he had and give it to the one with 10. That's the one who had started with five and doubled it to 10. In one of the other gospels, it says, well, master, he's, he's already got double. It's like the master didn't pay any attention to him. Yeah. See, let me tell you something. The father nor his son are democratic, left-wing, socialist progressives. That's clear enough for everybody in here's educated mind, isn't it? Hmm? He is not a democratic, socialist, what else did I say? Progressive. Now, he, he doesn't care anything about politics. What he cares about is principles. He does what he does in a principled way. Which means the one that produced the most with what he had to produce with was going to get what this other guy was unwilling to do anything with at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. It's no different today than it was then. Right. You don't give to somebody that doesn't do something and expect them to do something with it. Yeah. The only thing you can count on them doing with it is it won't be long and it'll all be gone. Right. I said it'll all be gone. Hmm? Give a bad steward the right lotto ticket. Yeah. <laughs> it'll be history in no time. It'll be history in no time. Give somebody an assignment that hadn't been faithful over the assignments that they've already been doing, they're going to screw up that assignment. That's why the best thing to do is to not give somebody a chance that doesn't deserve a chance yet. If they're not faithful over what they've already been given, just back off and let them approve themselves. And you can let them know. Say, listen, I believe you've got all kinds of capabilities. I know that you can do this, but until you do it, you're not going any further. As a matter of fact, if you don't learn to do what you've got to do right now, you're going to begin to regress. That's the way God looks at things. 
he and Jesus don't just say, oh gosh, I, son, I feel so sorry for him. I think, you know, you know, look at the situations they've been in. He don't have that conversation. He don't have that conversation. None of us, none of, probably none of us in here were, were born with a silver spoon in our mouth. And even, even if we were, that doesn't guarantee you being able to handle a whole set of, uh, uh, of silverware. <laughs> huh? I don't care what you were born with. It's what you do with what you're born with. And it's not just what you do with it for a little bit. It's what you've done with it until you see him face to face. Yeah. Amen. This is, the long, this is a race. Yeah. This is a race. Right. And we have to finish our course. It doesn't make any difference how strong you start. It's how strong you finish. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So no matter what you were privileged enough to have before, you're required to take care of what you have right now. But we live in a time now where we feel like we just got to bless everybody. We just got to bless everybody. We got to help everybody. Huh? We got to be sure everybody has something, you know, so they can, so they can make their dish payments. Huh? So they can have them a little recreational weed every once in a while. Now, I know present companies excluded, but we've got a lot of people watching online. And they don't know what most of you know, see. <laughs> Read the book of Proverbs where it talks about people that are lazy, slothful. There's no good end to those people. But yet now we almost, we, we almost put people like that on a pedestal. I mean, because of, you know, how they got there. Well, the only thing that we need to be concerned about is being sure that everywhere they can hear the truth, it's the truth, so they don't have to stay where they were. Yeah. You, know, you know, God's system of, of, of giving and being a blessing he really only talks about widows and the fatherless. Widows and the fatherless. And when he talks about widows, he's talking about widows indeed. Huh? Not just play widows. Not just widows that, you know, They still got some stuff going for them. He's talking about widows. Widows, widows that you know what they spend most of their time doing? They're at the church praying. They don't even want another man. I don't know why they don't. <laughs> I guess it may depend on who the man was. I don't know, you know. But, you know, say, so, yeah, I've had a couple of those husbands. <laughs> he didn't say anything about your crazy uncle that won't do anything. He didn't say you're responsible to take care of him. Because that's a Christian thing to do. You need to take care of him. He's had a hard life. Well, God has a different plan. If you've had a hard life, then I believe in the name of Jesus, you'll hook up with the real truth. And your hardness will be history. And your ability will increase to make your life a great life. But you'll never, never, ever get good being rewarded for what you don't do. That won't make a better person out of you. Might fix you long enough to go to Target or somewhere. Huh? 
get you some new skids or whatever. Hmm? Go out to eat somewhere, hit a high spot like Texas Roadhouse or something. Have your real fried meal. God's plan hadn't changed. And let me tell you something, there are nations, entire nations, that'll just be pushed away. Just pushed away. You know, those things we don't really even have an understanding. But I'm telling you, God was serious about his word. And the reason he was is because he knew that there would be people that would do it correctly. And he wanted them to realize the blessing of honoring him. Hallelujah. And we get to be honored forever and ever. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Here's the thing. It's not who you hear from. It's what you hear. You can go anywhere on any given Sunday and listen to something. But you'll never be free until you're exposed to the truth. And even then, you're responsible for doing what's required in order for that truth to produce in your life. So it's not good enough just to hear anything or something or three points in a poem or something tremendously eloquent or great big words from the uh, uh, dictionary, but the truth, the hard, cruel, delivering truth, because that's the only thing that'll do it. The only thing will do it is what hits you right between the eyes and then falls into your heart. It's the only thing that will make a difference. It's the only thing that will set you free and it's the only thing that will keep you free. Honestly, Over in chapter 2 of verse 4. Paul said, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. As I said, it makes no difference who you hear, it's what you hear. The messenger is only as valuable as the message. The church or the organization is only as valuable as the message that's preached. I don't care how cool the guy or gal is. I don't care how cool they look in skinny jeans. I don't care what they drive, where they live. What are they preaching? Are they, are they preaching the uncompromised word of God? Are they preaching the fact that it's finished? Are they preaching the fact that the only way that we can have what belongs to us 
is believe it before we see it. Believe it before we have it. And continue until we do. Or until we see him face to face. Either one of them will be a winner. The messenger means nothing. You know, Paul talked about being rude of speech, and I, I've been accused of that too. I'm just, or maybe it was ugly of speech, I don't remember. <laughs> but just like he said, that makes no difference whatsoever. But you see, there are always going to be people that have got something to say about your character. Or what you this or what you that. But you know, those things don't mean anything at all to God. What he's looking for is for somebody that'll tell the truth. That'll tell the truth. Whether anybody likes it or not. Because that's what Jesus did. He just told the truth. And then went about his business. They stayed pretty hacked at him too. They didn't like the fact that he, he didn't have a good form of godliness. He just spoke the truth. Why is that? Because he knew the truth was the only thing that would make him free. It's the only thing that will make him free. So being able to hear the truth, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. And if you're hungry for the truth, you'll recognize it. You'll not just see it in the fruit of those who minister it or who have been sitting under it for years. But you'll know it yourself. Because the truth stands out. The truth stands out. Paul was not about making a name for himself. And nobody that's the least bit saved should be thinking about making a name for themselves. What could your name be? What could your name be? What, what could people say about you that would put you in the same stratosphere with the Lord Jesus? I mean, the only thing we have that makes our identity the least bit cool is that we're the children of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a man of God. I'm a woman of God. My name makes no difference. Your name makes no difference. Jesus made himself of no reputation. He wasn't concerned in anybody seeing him that way. He wanted them to hear the truth about his father. He wanted them to make a decision based on the truth, not on charisma or dress or slick speech. He wanted it to be the truth. The truth, which is pretty sharp. The book of Hebrews says of the word that it's sharp and powerful as in a two-edged sword, able to divide the soul and the spirit, the joints from the marrow, and reveal even the intents of the heart. I like that part about the word because I believe that's speaking to you and me, yeah. Yeah. revealing to ourselves where we really are. Yeah. Right. You know, it's a good thing to question yourself. Yeah. It's a good thing for you. I mean, nobody is better at holding your feet to the fire than you are. Yeah. Right. Right. And if you can develop that habit of holding your feet to the fire, then you will find things get better and better and better. How could you put a premium on, on the words that will set you free from depression, from addiction, from perversion, from yourself. 
how could you beat that kind of word that would bring so much peace into your life that you were almost embarrassed you had so much peace? You thought, shouldn't I be worried about something? That's the way my mom was. <laughs> Things would be going wrong. She said, honey, don't you think you should be worried about that? I said, right now I'm just concerned with taking care of me. I can't take care of these things that look to be very worrisome. (laughs) And you know what? That never changes. There's always things. There's always things that you can worry about, fret about, talk about, whine about, cry about. But you know what? The best thing to do is to just do what he's asked you to do. He said, keep your eyes on me and I'll keep you in perfect peace. The truth, people need to know they're healed. And what did I say on the, on the program today? I said this, and I, uh, several, several of those that were tagged in put it in there also. I said something like, the word is not an addendum to my life. It is my life. It's not an addendum to my life. It is my life. It's life to me. I believe it's responsible for how healthy I am. I give the Word of God, all the credit. I believe I'm as prosperous as I am because of the Word of God. Not because of any of my brilliance. I mean, I was a world-class spender. I mean, I had credit cards like a deck of cards. <laughs> I did forget to tell Kathy about that before we got married. She was, she was a little bit upset when I sprung the credit card bills on her. But by that time, she already loved me. Bless her darling heart. And because of her expertise at tightness. <laughs> she was able to fix my loose spending. To trim my credit cards down. I carry some now, but I dare not use them. (laughs) To God be the glory for the way life is today. And to God be the glory for how much much better the life can be day after day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it's all because of what we heard and put to work in our life. Don't ever get offended at the word. Really, I would encourage you not to get offended at the messenger. I mean, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm not. If I was doing it for money, I'd have took this show on the road. Honestly. I may have gone to a different neighborhood. Obviously not in New Mexico. But you can only be successful where you're supposed to be. And you can only be truly blessed where you're supposed to be. That's why we don't pursue anything but Him. And let him take care of business. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.
One last verse and we'll go a little bit late. But that's all right. Ephesians chapter 3. Verses you're familiar with. Powerful verses. Verse 20 and 21. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. The only thing I see in here that we're in charge of is the power that we allow in us. When you and I allow the Word of God to be all it wants to be in us, that's exactly what it'll be. It'll be everything we need and then some. What did he say? Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Can you imagine that? You get to a place where you're thinking about something that you really weren't even thinking about. And then all of a sudden, something happens. And whatever it was shows up. Whatever it is, is taken care of. And all you've been doing is acknowledging that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above. You don't have to do any figuring. Don't have to do any wondering. You don't have to do any reasoning. Because he's able to do far beyond what we can ask or think. Hallelujah. Please remember, it's not who you hear. It's what you hear from them. Amen.